Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. Today we're going to take a deep dive look on this latest device from Ambernic. It is called the RG353V. Now the RG353V will probably look a little bit familiar to you. After all, I think this is the fourth vertical handheld that Ambernic has made to date. The one that it most closely resembles is this one here, the RG351V. Now this one released back in the olden times of March 2021, and it has an older chipset, the RK3326. Well, the new one that we have here has an upgraded chip from the RK3326. This one has the RK3566, which is the same chip that is found in this device here. And this is one of the more recent Ambernic releases as well. It is called the RG353P. So in essence, the RG353V is a mix between these two. It has a similar form factor to the 351V, but the same power and performance as the 353P. And so in this video, we're going to do an in-depth review and look at everything related to it in terms of price to performance, as well as ergonomics and everything else. And of course, we'll spend a lot of time talking about whether or not this is going to be a good fit for you in the games that you want to play. Now, I'm expecting this to be a pretty long video, so grab your favorite drink, maybe some cheese and crackers, and let's get into it. Okay, if you go to the Ambernic website, you'll see that there are two different models that are actually for sale, the 353V and the 353VS. And contrary to most naming schemes, the one with the VS is actually the cheaper model. The V goes for $120, it's currently on a pre-order discount, and the VS is going to be about $100, but right now the pre-order price is $90. And so you may be asking, what's the difference between the two? Well, to answer that, we're going to look at a Venn diagram. In the center here, you can see all the things that both devices have. Have. By default, it can boot a Linux operating system from the SD card, and they have the same chip and display, and they're also capable of 5 GHz Wi-Fi, Bluetooth 4.2, and HDMI out and they're each going to give you about six hours of battery life too. Now the most striking difference here is that there are only two color options available for the VS and there are four for the V. And the other main thing is that the V can not only boot into Linux but also Android. And so to make it more capable with Android they've doubled the RAM to two gigs. They've also included 32 gigs of storage for that operating system. And finally it also has a touch screen. So at the end of the day the VS is more tailored to just a Linux operating system and getting it out the door a little bit more cheaply. Whereas the high priced V model is kind of the best of both worlds. Not only can you have that same Linux operating system, but you'll also have all the features that are embedded into Android, and we'll take a look at those later in the video as well. And by virtue of having double the RAM as the other, there are certain things that will play better on Linux as well. In particular, there are a bunch of PC ports that can be run on these models, and the two gigabytes of RAM are going to help in that regard. And so at the end of the day, the RG353V is more capable than the other one, but it is going to set you back an additional 20 bucks. Now this was a review unit sent to me by Ambernick. All opinions are my own, no money was exchanged in any way, and they are not seeing this video before I release it. And the model that I'm reviewing today is the 353V, so the more expensive model with the dual boot into Android. Inside the box you're going to find a USB-C charging cable, and also depending on the model that you purchase you may get an additional SD card filled with games. I have the 64 gigabyte model here. Also inside is a user manual. You know I used to make fun of the user manuals from Ambernick, but this one actually Actually is pretty good. I would say over the past two or three devices they've gotten really good about actually putting useful information inside. And finally it also comes with a tempered glass screen protector. So let's go ahead and do the big reveal. Now I didn't have a choice in what color I was going to be getting but it looks like they sent me the gray model. And yeah I would say it actually looks pretty good. I would say the color scheme is very similar to a Game Boy DMG but definitely not perfect. Now first impressions here, it has a compact and very sturdy feel to it, and it has a nice build quality. It feels solid. The next thing that really struck me about it is the texture of the plastic. This has a nice gritty feel to it. I feel like recently Ambernic has made a lot of slick feeling devices and this is not one of them. But yeah, I really like this texture here. Okay, on the right side here we have two SD card slots and one's already filled with a 16 gigabyte card. This here is the Linux based operating system that comes with every device. The second card would go in here and this is where you would put your games. Also on the right we have a reset and power button that are flush with the case. Up top we have a USB-C port for peripherals and then a mini HDMI out for video and additionally a headphone jack. On the left side all we have is a volume up and down rocker. Now like with the power and reset buttons these are flush with the case so I don't think you're going to accidentally press down on them. You kind of have to be deliberate in pressing down on these and I think it's actually a good thing. And on the bottom we have our USB-C charging port. 
On the back we have the shoulder and trigger buttons. The triggers themselves are a little bit more narrow and stick out just a hair more than the shoulder buttons. And all four of these have a ski slope to them and have a nice soft kind of clicky sound. The clickiness here reminds me a little bit of a PS Vita's face buttons or the shoulder buttons on a Nintendo Switch Lite. So overall I'm kind of happy with the design here on the back. Now let's take a look at the front. Now the first thing you're probably thinking is, man, these analog sticks are really low. Who's gonna use these things? And honestly, I cannot disagree with that sentiment. The analog sticks themselves are almost exactly like what you would find on a Nintendo Switch. They are nice and responsive and have a good amount of range to them. And I do like the fact that they are indented into the case so they don't stick out too much. They also click down for L3 and R3. Next, in the center, we have this one single mono speaker. And I've heard some people saying that this is awkwardly placed, but honestly, I actually like where they've put it. With a lot of other Game Boy style vertical handhelds, they put the speaker on the right bottom corner. And my issue with that location is that your hands will often cover up the speaker as you're playing. And so honestly, I like the speaker placement here in the center because that means my fingers aren't going to cover up the audio and it'll be nice and crisp. Now let's take a look at the face buttons. These have a rubber membrane connection just like most of the other Ambernick products. And they have that nice old school rubbery feel. If you're familiar with a Super Nintendo or Nintendo controller, this is very similar. So no complaints here. I think the buttons are an appropriate size and they have a good amount of travel as well. Next, let's take a look at the D-pad. This has the same style connection as the face buttons and has that same kind of responsive rubbery feel. Again, this feels a lot like those old school Nintendo D-pads. In relation to the rest of the device, I like the location of the face buttons and D-pad. Because these are the controls you're going to be using most often, it makes sense to have them front and center. Now all the other buttons, the select, start, and function buttons, all have a rubber membrane connection as well, and so these have a similar feel as the others. Overall, I have no complaints about the feel of the buttons as well as their placement. Those analog sticks are another story, but we'll get back to them. Now in terms of just ergonomics and holding this device in your hands, I would say it's pretty comfortable, but a little bit cramped just by virtue of being a vertical handheld. The ski slopes on the back do allow you to rest your index fingers on the shoulder and trigger buttons, and it is easy to press one or the other as you need to. In general, I would use the meat of my fingers to press the shoulders and then the tips of them to press the triggers, and this works out pretty well. Now in terms of how to hold your hands behind the device, you've got one of two options. You can either just kind of bunch them up or interlace your your fingers. Personally, I like to bunch them up here. When I interlace them, I feel like they get a little bit sweaty and hot. Okay, now let's talk about those analog sticks. I think when it comes to just the left analog stick and the face buttons, it's fine. Now when it comes to using both analog sticks at the same time, yeah, it's not comfortable. A lot of that has to do with the fact that when you are using dual analogs, you're often going to use the shoulders and triggers at the same time. And this design is not a great setup. As you can see, there's a big distance between the shoulders and triggers and the analog sticks. And it just feels kind of awkward to hold it in this place and it would get downright painful over time. And so I would say it's going to be just fine if you're going to play something that uses a left analog stick, but the moment you start trying to use the right analog stick as well, it's not going to be a great time. But like I mentioned earlier, the majority of the time you're going to be using the D-pad and the face buttons anyway, and when it comes to the design and the location of these, it's just fine. So I think overall in terms of ergonomics, I would give this device a 6 out of 10. The D-pad and face buttons are just fine, the left analog stick works as well, but by virtue of being a vertical handheld, it is a little bit cramped, and having two analog sticks here in the bottom just doesn't make sense. Okay, let's take a few minutes and talk about size. We're going to use the RG351V as a comparison. Now, when the RG351V here came out about a year and a half ago, I initially wasn't a huge fan of the device. Despite looking like it was going to be a nice and compact device, it was unexpectedly large. And I think in that regard, the new RG353V is more in line to the size that I was expecting. Now, when comparing the two, I would definitely say the RG351V is a little bit roomier when it comes to just the overall feel. Although I do think the shoulders and triggers were less comfortable and more clicky on the 351V than this new one. I think the reason why the old device feels more roomy than the new one is just because it's much more wide. That does result in giving your hands a little bit more space to work with and it's not as cramped. But of course, bigger isn't always better. In this regard, I actually think that the 353V just looks a lot better and it feels nice and compact and a little bit economical as well. It's like every single space was used a little bit more judiciously. I had a similar experience with this device here. This is the Pal Kitty RGB20S. This one came out about six months ago and like with the 353V, I really appreciated how compact it was. In fact, as you can see, it's about the same size as the 353V. However, when you put them side by side, the 
Pal Kitty just seems much more poorly designed. It has similar ski slope buttons on the back, but these are really chunky and don't really feel good to press down on either. If I had to choose between the two, I would pick the Ambernic ones every time. Not only are the Ambernic buttons more compact, but they make the device stick out less than the other one too. And when you actually press down on the Pal Kitty buttons, it's not a pleasant experience. They kind of have a mushy and thunky quality to them, not like the Ambernic one, which feels more precise, but also nice and soft. And so I think when it comes to an inline shoulder and trigger situation like what we're seeing here, the Ambernic one is probably one of the best designs around. Now looking at the front, the Pow Kitty device now kind of looks like a little bit of a hot mess. Yes, it's super cute. I love this little tiger sticker, but it never really made sense to have the D-pad and the face buttons here on the bottom. It was never comfortable from the get-go. Meanwhile, the 353V has them in the center and this just feels much more naturally comfortable. Now, sadly, it's not gonna have room for a tiger sticker here, but I still think it's the superior design. So now let's take a second and talk about pocketability. Overall, I think the company did a pretty good job here of making sure that none of the elements stick out too much from the device. The analog sticks are a little bit higher than the D-pad and there is a possibility they would maybe catch in your pocket. But I think the device would have been way less comfortable if they had pushed them down any further. It's kind of a similar setup with the buttons on the back as well. These do stick out more than the device itself. But at least in my initial testing, I found the device to be actually quite pocketable. I never really thought the 351V was a pocketable device, but this one does slip in and out of my shorts pockets pretty easily. It might be a different story if you were to try to do this with something a little bit tighter like jeans, but at least from my perspective, yeah, I wouldn't mind having this in my pocket. Okay, last piece of hardware to talk about is the screen. This is a three and a half inch IPS panel with OCA lamination. And as you can see, this model has a nice gray bezel around it as well. The screen itself is a little bit indented into the case, which actually makes it a really great fit to put a screen protector on. And luckily one ships with a device. So let's put that on real quick. I recently made a video where I talked about the hinge method of applying a screen protector. It's where you use some tape to make sure everything is nice and aligned. And so I'll leave a link to that in the video description in case you missed it. But yeah, just as simple as using a little bit of tape to make sure everything's nice and aligned. And so now let's take a look at the screen with the screen protector on. Now it actually sticks out a little bit from the case, but I kind of like it when screen protectors do this, it gives them a little bit of a pop. And it's always nice to have that peace of mind, especially if you're going to be sliding this into your pocket. Let's do a quick screen quality comparison. Now all four of these systems are running at 50% brightness and you can see among them, the RG353V is definitely the brightest, but I would also say it's the most washed out and has a little bit more of a green hue compared to the others. It's a similar story at 100% brightness. You can see the 353V is much brighter and would probably do better in outdoor conditions than the others, but it is gonna look way more washed out while indoors. I've actually been using the device at about a 40 to 50% brightness at all times. And finally, here's what it looks like at a 1% brightness. Now I'm filming this during the day, so we're not gonna get a full experience here, but you can definitely see the 353V is still the brightest among all of these. And so what this means to me is that within the same class, the 353V is going to be the best to use in an outdoor condition, but it may not be ideal for playing in a very dark room like next to your significant other. Okay, now let's do some size comparisons against other retro handhelds. We've already seen the RGB20S and the 351V, but here they are again for reference. Next, we have Ambernick's first vertical handheld, which is the RG300, as well as the analog pocket. Here's another vertical handheld, the Pow Kitty A20. And I've made video reviews of all these devices in the past, so if you want to check them out, they're in my back catalog. Next, let's do a comparison of the smaller handheld. So this is the 280V as well as the Miu Mini. Now, these two devices are quite a bit smaller than the 353V and much more pocketable. And so if you're really looking for ultra portable, between these three, I would probably say the Miu Mini is going to be your best bet. Two other devices to compare, here's the Retroid Pocket 3 as well as the Ambernic RG353P. If you remember in my Retroid Pocket 3 video, I actually said this was a pocketable device. It does look rather large compared to the 353V, but most of that pocketability comes from the fact that it is nice and thin. In fact, it's really just a little bit larger than your typical large phone. And so I would say that both of these devices are relatively pocketable, but for different reasons. The Retroid Pocket 3 is nice and slim, whereas the 353V is just compact and small enough to fit in the pocket. Okay, that's about it for hardware. Let's move on to software now. I'm gonna add that second SD card to my device and then boot it up. Now remember, this is the stock Linux operating system from Ambernic. 
And as you can see, the boot time for this is about 27 seconds altogether. Now we've seen this operating system a few times in the past. It is based off of Bodicera version 31, and they've shipped it with the same devices that use this chipset, the RG353P as well as the 503. And so I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about performance since we've already seen that in previous videos, but I do kind of want to give you a feel for how the navigation experience is gonna be. You'll navigate through the different systems, then go into the games list, and then you can pick your games from here. Now remember, these are all all preloaded on that 64 gigabyte card. But I gotta say, they've really improved the configuration with this stock operating system. For example, Game Boy games now boot with the correct aspect ratio, and they also have this nice DMG colorization as well. And so you don't even have to go into the settings to set this up, it's gonna be like this out of the gate. Same thing with Game Boy Color, this one is also at the correct aspect ratio and it looks really nice on this little device. In particular, these two systems are very fitting for this form factor. But yeah, I think somebody went through and corrected all these configurations, and it's pretty great for newcomers. For example, Game Boy Advance is now at the 3x2 aspect ratio, as it should be. And so while many of you watching know how to set up those configurations already, I think this is a really great thing for newcomers as well. You're not going to have to spend a lot of time setting things up. This is just going to be pre-configured for you. Now for those who are more particular about how the games look, there are some options you can do to improve things. For example, the pixel scaling here on the NES is not correct. You can see that with Mega Man's life bar here on the top left. All of these health bars should be perfectly balanced. Now there are many ways you could address this, but here's what I recommend. You're going to press the function and start button to exit out of the game. And then once you're back in the menu, press select and then go into advanced system options. This is going to select all of your NES options and within here you will select shader set. Now Bodicera is limited in the shaders it has available, but the one that's probably going to work the best is the one here called scan lines. So just go ahead and select that and then back out. Now when you start up the game, you can see that the health bar on the top left is nice and balanced. It's also going to give the game a somewhat retro feel as you're playing it too. So that's a quick and easy way to fix the pixel scaling if it looks a little bit off to you. Anyway, moving on, there are not a lot of settings that you're going to need to tweak if you want to play a lot of these classic systems. Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo look very good out of the gate. You could always add the scanline shader if you wanted to get it perfectly balanced, but as it stands, these two look very good as they are. And additionally, when I'm not comparing other screens to this screen directly, I actually find that I really like the screen on this device. Not only is it nice and rich and vibrant, but it has wonderful viewing angles as well. So long story short, when you are comparing it to others, it may not be the best, but on its own, it's great. And additionally, like I suspected, having that speaker here in the center is actually very nice. I feel like the 353V has some of the best sound that I've heard in a handheld in a while. And honestly, I don't think that Ambernick upgraded the speaker at all. I think it's just a better position and placement. Okay, moving on to D-pad controls, I think these are really nicely balanced. To me, the amount of pivot and travel here is very reminiscent of a Super Nintendo D-pad. And so when playing fighting games, I'm having no problem throwing fireballs like this. And overall, when it comes to performance, Arcade works really well on this device too. It's not quite enough to play Killer Instinct, but everything below that should run just fine. That means the entire Neo Geo catalog is going to be at your fingertips, and you'll be able to play up through CPS3 no problem as well. When it comes to Nintendo DS, this runs perfectly fine as well. I actually turned on the high resolution setting here, so we're getting a 2x resolution right now. Surprisingly, the stock Linux operating system does detect a touch on the touch screen, but unfortunately it does not allow you to actually control the movement. It just moves up to the top left corner. But they do have it set up that you can press L2 and R2 to switch between the screens or toggle between seeing both at once or one at a time. So Nintendo DS will work on the Linux side, but it is going to be a little bit limited just based on the touchscreen controls. Moving over to PS1, as expected, it works just fine here, no problems whatsoever. In fact, when it comes to performance, all the systems from PS1 and below are going to play just fine. The real rub comes from everything above that. Let's start with Nintendo 64. By default, without any configurations, you will get some pretty good performance with Nintendo 64, but they have set it to a 240p resolution. This makes the text very hard to read, and it also is just going to look really pixelated and washed out. Now if you'd like, you can adjust this to 480p, and under 4x3 resolution, we'll change it to 640x480. And so now the games are going to play at 480p, but you will take a performance hit. For example, F-Zero X played just fine at 240p, but it does slow down to about 54-56 frames per second at times using the 480p resolution instead. 
And so while many games are going to play at 480p just fine, like Star Fox 64 and Legend of Zelda, it's really going to be up to you to find that balance between performance and graphical fidelity. I'm the kind of guy who really likes to have 480p resolution on a 480p display, but if you want to make sure that some of those harder to play games do run at least a little bit better, then 240p might be a better choice. And you could always set up these resolutions on a per game basis if you'd like as well. Moving over to Dreamcast, they also had this one set up to 240p, but I also upscaled it within the RetroArch Quick menu. And honestly, for this system, I would recommend 480p. All the games that came on the SD card actually played really well with the 480p resolution. The gameplay itself is smooth, although it is not running at a crisp 60 frames per second, so there's probably some sort of auto frame skip happening here. But honestly, at the end of the day, the performance is actually pretty good. I was actually surprised to find that the stock Dreamcast experience was better than it was on the 503 and 353p when I did my testing. Now PSP is another story, even the games that came with it like Tekken 6 did not play at full speed. This is at a 1x resolution with no frame skip and as you can see it cannot reach 60 frames per second. So unfortunately PSP on the stock operating system is not very good at all. But luckily we have some other options available to us. For example, on the RG353P, there is a custom firmware called Jealous that is available. And because these devices use the same chip and are made by the same manufacturer, I decided to throw in the Jealous SD cards and see how they worked. And much to my surprise and delight, they booted up just fine. Now the Jealous custom firmware is a little bit unique in its development. This is considered a developer's build, which means that the developers only really focus on the things that interest them the most. And as of making this video, I'm not sure that the Jealous team plans on porting this over officially to the 353V. But it is nice to see that out of the box, this mostly works anyway. And so I spent a few hours testing the Jealous operating system on the 353V, and let me show you the results here. Okay, when it comes to the lower end systems, things like Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Genesis, stuff like that, absolutely no problem, they all play just fine. And all of these scaling and aspect ratios and everything else like that are pre-configured on Jealous as well. Where this operating system really shines is the performance with certain systems. For example, Sega Saturn uses the standalone Yabasan Shiro core and it works really well. I would not say that every Saturn game is going to be playable, but at least 75% are going to be at playable speed. And this performance is identical to what I saw with the 353P and I did an entire showcase video about that and I'll leave that linked in the video description as well. But at least with this initial testing you can see that there's no problem here, most of these games are playing fine. Now there are a lot of Nintendo 64 emulation options available on Jealous and most of them are actually pretty great too. By default I typically will use the Parallel Rice Core and as you can see it's running F0 at 480p with absolutely no slowdown unlike what we saw in the stock operating system. And so by default I would recommend using this core and then testing out others in case there is a certain game that doesn't run very well. As of making this video there are three different standalone emulators that work pretty well. Unfortunately the one that works the best among them which is called the Glide N64 version it unfortunately is not booting on the latest build on the 353V. So hopefully we see a fix for that sometime in the future so we can get the absolute best performance we can on the Linux side. Either way I would say at least 75% of games are going to run just fine on this. I would say those top tier games, you know things like Cruisin' USA or Goldeneye or Conker's Bad Fur Day, they're just not going to play at a full frame rate. Same thing with Banjo-Tooie as well as Perfect Dark. Now Perfect Dark has its own share of problems as well because by using the dual analog sticks it's kind of uncomfortable anyway. But suffice to say, there are plenty of Nintendo 64 games that are going to play well on the RG353V. It's just not going to play every single game under the sun perfectly. I was also surprised to find that in my testing, the Dreamcast performance was worse on Jealous than it was on the stock operating system. Now these things sometimes come and go. They call these regressions. It's when an update to an emulator happens, but it actually decreases the performance. And so it may be that two weeks from now, this will actually be running even better. But as it stands, at least as of today, only about half the games were playing at full speed when I tested them. Now, if you come across a Dreamcast game that is not playing at full speed, what you can do is go into the RetroArch menu in Jealous by pressing Select and X. And then under Performance, you have the ability to turn on Auto Frame Skip or just Regular Frame Skip. Auto Frame Skip is good if you're only having a little bit of slowdown, but if it's something that's pretty drastic, then I would use a frame skip of 1. It is going to make the games run at a lower frame rate. For example, Dead or Alive here is now running at about 30 frames per second, but the gameplay is relatively smooth. And so I recommend playing it by ear. If it doesn't play at a full frame rate out of the box, then I would go in and try out an Auto Frame Skip. And then if that doesn't work, then I would turn the frame skip on to 1. Between those three, you might find that most Dreamcast games are going to work okay, but they won't be perfect. 
Next, let's try PSP, and this one runs a lot better than the stock operating system. In general, I played most of the games at a 1x resolution because with this small of a screen, you're not really going to see much of a difference between 1x and 2x when it comes to graphical fidelity. And that does mean at a 1x resolution, many more games are going to play better. And I would say in general, about 50 or 60% of games play just fine at a 1x resolution with no need to change anything else. Other games will work better if you turn on the skip buffer effects option, and you really have to try this out on a per game basis to see which one will work best. Now for some games it's not going to matter either way, you will have to turn on a frame skip. Like with Dreamcast this is going to make the gameplay less smooth, but they will run at a faster rate. But there are still going to be quite a few games on the high end that are not going to play well. When it comes to Nintendo DS, it's about the same story as it was on the stock operating system, the games run just fine. And you can use the trigger buttons to swap between the screens and all that as well. And like with the stock operating system, the touchscreen does not work on this one either. Now one of the nice things about using a custom operating system on Linux for this device is that you can use Portmaster. And Portmaster is going to allow you to run PC ports of many games that you wouldn't expect to play on a device as low powered as this. And I made several videos in the past about this feature, but yes, Portmaster works great on the 353V. And so, all things considered, yes, you can have custom firmware on the RG353V. As of right now, the 353P version of Jealous works pretty well, and I've been told that there will be a test version of ArcOS coming soon as well. And that's awesome news to hear considering that this device is brand new. Now, when running the stock operating system, it's pretty easy to switch over to Android. What you do is you press on the function button and then the power button and it'll boot into it. But the other thing you can do is just eject the first SD card, power on the device, and then it'll automatically go into Android. And so let's take a couple minutes and go through this as well. Now, this runs a version of Android 11 that sadly still does not have the Google Play Store but it does come bundled with a bunch of preloaded apps. Among those, I would pay attention to the Nintendo 64 and Nintendo DS emulators because they run really well on Android, especially compared to Linux. So it's as simple as opening up the app, then navigating to wherever your games are stored on the second SD card, and then you can load up your games. And thankfully, the Nintendo 64 performance on this is much better than it is on Linux. For example, even those top tier games are going to play at full speed if you use the right emulation profile. So yes, Nintendo 64 is perfectly playable on this device, but it's going to be more playable on the Android side than on Linux. Another thing that's been embedded on the Android side with this release is the new Ambernic front end. And I did a dedicated video to this about a month ago. But in essence, this is going to function a lot like the Linux operating system. You'll navigate through the systems and then go into your games list. Now, unfortunately, Ambernic kind of screwed up when it came to the configuration of this. For example, when it comes to Nintendo 64, they didn't use the standalone emulator that works really well. Instead, they just pointed it to RetroArch. And so what that means is if you use the front end to launch Nintendo 64 games, you're going to get worse performance than if you just use the standalone app instead. And so they kind of shot themselves in the foot where they made this really nice and fancy interface, but you're not really going to want to use it when it comes to high-end gaming. But for low-end systems, things that run really well with RetroArch, it works just fine. By the way, to exit out of a game once you've started it up here in the front end, you would just hold on to the function button for about two seconds. Now, thankfully, the front end does point to the standalone Nintendo DS emulator that works really well. But unfortunately, it's not configured properly, as you can see here. But it is easy enough to set it up so that it's configured correctly. And I have a whole walkthrough on that in my Android starter guide if you're interested. Either way, the main feature about Nintendo DS on the Android side is that the touchscreen works well. In fact, it registered all my touchscreen inputs, even with the screen protector on, and even in the very corners as well. And I've also set up the triggers to be hotkeys to swap out the screen like they are on Linux too, so this is the best of both worlds. The front end also boots into PSP, but the configuration is all screwed on this anyway. Regardless, the performance is better on the Linux side anyway, so I would recommend using that. So yeah, it's unfortunate, but the systems that work the best with this front end are going to be the low end systems that run on RetroArch. But the honest truth is here, the navigation and front end on Linux is a little bit more streamlined and user friendly anyway. And so while I appreciate the fact that they made it, I really don't think there's a point to it. Now to exit the front end, you would just swipe down from the top here, press the little Ambernic button, and you'll be back to the original screen. One other thing that works really well on the Android side is running Moonlight. It's already pre-installed on the device and it'll allow you to connect to a computer and then you can then run your emulator from there. And thanks to the 5 GHz Wi-Fi connection, the streaming is nice and stable. On my computer, I'm running at a 720p resolution and then in Moonlight, it's converting it over to 480p to match the screen on the device. And it looks fantastic as you can see. 
You could even play some PC games on here as well, but I would not recommend first-person shooters just by virtue of the ergonomics. But something isometric like Hades would work just fine. So essentially, the features I enjoy the most on Android are going to be Nintendo 64 emulation, the touchscreen controls of Nintendo DS, as well as Moonlight streaming that's very easy to set up. Now, Moonlight is available on the Linux operating systems, but it's not quite as easy to get running. Either way, that's Android in a nutshell. So two more things I want to test before we start wrapping up. Number one is going to be HDMI out. On the stock operating system, it works great out of the box. All I had to do was plug in my mini HDMI cable and everything was working fine. It even maintains the aspect ratio for these systems. So 3x2 for Game Boy Advance and 4x3 for Super Nintendo. Now on the Jealous firmware, the results were mixed. I was able to navigate through Emulation Station and the menus, but when I tried to boot up a game based on RetroArch, it would just show a black screen. However, when using a standalone emulator like this one for Sega Saturn, it worked just fine. And it maintained the correct aspect ratio as well. And it does work on Android but it scales everything to 16 by 9 and I think that looks fine in the menus but when it comes to actually running a game it's going to stretch everything out to the full screen and so for example when I'm playing Dogs, which should be in 4x3 you can see it's in 16 by 9 I mean I know I have been spoiling my dog and giving it all sorts of treats but there's no way it's gained this much weight in this short of time Next, let's try out Bluetooth. This works really well on the stock operating system as well as on Android. On the Linux side, you're only going to be able to use it for Bluetooth controllers, but when you use it on Android, you could use Bluetooth headphones as well. Now, unfortunately, the Jealous developers do not support Bluetooth on their devices, so I wouldn't expect it on here, but I think it might be possible on ArcOS. I guess we'll have to test that one out here in the future. Either way, on stock, Bluetooth controllers work just fine. If you combine this with the video out, you now have made a small little console, which is kind of cool. All right, we've been at this forever, so let's go ahead and start wrapping up. We'll start with what I like about the Ambernic RG353V. Number one, I think the device itself has a very nice solid feel to it. The plastic is nice and gritty, and it's just really well made. I like the fact that they have four different color options available at the high tier model. I do like this gray one a lot, but I think the white and the transparent purple are super awesome too. The D-pad and buttons on this are excellent, some of the best that I've ever felt on an Ambernic device. I also like the fact that overall the RG353V has a clean design. I especially like the fact that there isn't a huge bezel with Ambernic painted on the front. I also think that in general the device has a good shape and size. It's very compact feeling and easily fits in my pocket as well. Also thanks to the fact that this is the third device to come with this same chip, we now have custom firmware that's just about ready to go across the board. Often it can take several months for these firmwares to release, and it's pretty cool that it's ready to go right when the device releases. And finally, it's surprising to say, but Ambernic actually got the price pretty right on this device. It feels like for the past four or five devices, they've been charging a lot more than I thought they were worth. But with a retail price of about $100 to $120, depending on the model you get, I think that's a reasonable value when it comes to cost to performance. Okay, so that's what I like about the 353V, now let's talk about what I don't like. Number one is the ergonomics when it comes to the analog sticks and the trigger buttons. Even though they shipped it with a dual analog setup, I cannot think of a time when I would actually want to use both analog sticks at the same time. I personally feel like the right analog stick just doesn't really need to be there in the first place. Next, this isn't really a dig on the device itself, but all vertical handhelds to me feel a little bit cramped. In general, I would say that they are just not quite as comfortable as something with a horizontal form factor. I also think the launch of this device is a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. For somebody who's not tech savvy or brand new to retro handhelds, this can be a little bit intimidating. Not only are there two different models to choose from, but there are different operating systems for each. I know for me, a couple years ago when I first got into the whole handheld thing, this would have been really confusing to me. And so I think that Ambernic probably could have done better if they had just picked one model and stuck with that. On one hand, it's pretty cool that they're giving customers the choice, but on the other hand, I think they would move more units if they had a more simple approach. And finally, the fact that there are so many similar devices out there on the market doesn't really help anything either. Just over the past couple weeks, I've seen a big uptick in people asking me what specific device is going to be best for them. With so many devices on the market, like the Retroid Pocket 3 or the 353P, it's very hard to decide which one's going to be the best. And honestly, it's hard for me to say one way or the other because they're all so very similar. And so for the final part of the video here, we're going to talk a little bit about whether or not the 353V is going to be a good fit for 
for you in particular. To start, let's go back to that Venn diagram and talk about the difference between the two models that are here. Now we've already touched on this earlier in the video, but just to recap, if you want to use Android and the features that come with it, for example, the best Nintendo 64 emulation or touchscreen Nintendo DS, then yeah, the 353V might be a better choice. But if you're content with the Linux side and you want to save about 20% of the price, then the 353VS is not a bad choice either. And so to help you decide whether or not the RG353V is a good fit, we're going to play this game here. You're going to start with zero hit points and then you're going to go through all of these items here in these columns. If any of them apply to you, you'll check them off. If they're on the left side, you will minus one hit point. If they're on the right, you'll add a hit point. And so once you're done going through all of these, it should give you a better idea of whether or not this is worth consideration. If you end up with negative hit points, then I would say you're dead. You shouldn't consider the RG353V and you should look into other devices. If you end up with zero hit points, then it's kind of a wash. I would also say the 353V is probably not a good fit. You should wait for something else. But if you end up with positive hit points and the higher the hit points, the better, then maybe this is something worth thinking about. Either way, let me know what score you got in the comments below. I'm really curious to see how this all pans out and if it ends up being accurate. Anyway, that's about it for this video. I hope that it was helpful in kind of determining whether or not the Ambernic RG353V is a device worth considering. At the end of the day, there are so many devices on the market, it's really hard to say that yes, this is the one to get. Pound for pound, I still think the best device under $150 is going to be the Retroid Pocket 3, but I think a vertical form factor has its own certain appeal to it, and among the mid-size vertical handhelds, this is the best one yet. If you want something even smaller, I still think you should consider the Miu Mini, but all the same, the 353V is a hit. As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.